But if I am doing the very thing that I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that which want, that wants to do good, for I am joyful, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the sin making me the prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who I will set free from the body of this death. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. This is the word of God. Our hymn of preparation, grace is greater than all our sins.
greater than all of our sins. Amen. Praise God. We will now please remain standing for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel comes to us from Matthew, the 11th chapter, reading verses 16 to 19 and verses 25 to 30. Glory be to you, Lord. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, beginning at the 16th verse. And Jesus says, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets, and calling unto their fellows, and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, He hath a devil. But the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But the wisdom is justified of our children. Now we go to verse 25. And at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed it unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed in thy sight, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal it to him. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am weak and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. My brothers and sisters, the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Stuff. 
you can just use it. Um, you are supposed to use it for the intent for which it is given. And so I had to go. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so I had to go back to the doors because the two generators were given for St. Paul's. And I went back to them and I said, look, it, there's no, it's unnecessary to use two generators at St. Paul's because the one generator can not only power St. Paul's but also the uh, reverse osmosis plant, which we intend to build right here on St. Paul's property. I need your permission to give the, net, the other generator to St. Andrews. Go ahead. Go ahead. So St. Andrews to get a new generator. Guess what? See, now I'm just going to get a new bus. Oh, yeah! I'm going to get a new bus. And the first Lord's Day in the new church year, we're going to rededicate the chapels at St. Andrews and here at St. Paul's. It's going to be a wonderful time. Oh, yeah. I give a lot of credit to my brother Emmerich. Yes. I have never seen something very hard. That's my right hand. That's my right hand. And I thank God for him. I thank God for the various teams that um, distribute the the uh, hurricane relief packages and uh, Brother Bert and Sister Carla and Sister Lolita and the Sister Anne and the rest of the team who work with me to make everything run so smoothly yes. so that I don't have to work too hard, Brother Leroy. Huh? And I thank Brother Leroy also, yes. Brother Leroy. Yes. Yes. I am very happy and very pleased. And one of the things that I am so proud of is that our people never have to go on no land and asking nobody for nothing. Amen. So if you find yourself in need of something, don't come to me. Go to Ember. <laughs> I have more news for St. Andrews. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now we know that um, the work has been very difficult for me. It's very difficult coming one um, active minister not discounting the work of Reverend Weir, but you have one active minister. So there's always a need for additional help. Sister Carmen is doing a wonderful job down in St. Davis. And so I've been praying to God for help. Send me a man. And God didn't listen to me, send me a woman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really didn't listen to me. He listened, right? He listened, right? So, Sister Lolita is going to be transferred down to St. Andrews to assist with the work of St. Andrews. Sister Lolita has already completed her bachelor's degree in theology, so we give her. And she's poised to become an accredited local preacher. And she has indicated her desire to become a lay pastor in the Baptist Church. Amen. So when the circuit council sits again, we will bring that before the circuit council. And I am positive, so the leader, you're going to get 100 percent support. Yes. Then I will take it to conference in January, and you will get 100 percent support there. And she will begin her training to become a lay pastor. The only thing that concerns me is that when Sister Lolita is transferred, Kyle is going to try to go with her. <laughs> and Everett, it's your job, so, to see that that doesn't happen. This morning we're going to talk about the battle of the two natures, and it comes from the epistle that was read by Brother Burke, where we find the Apostle Paul struggling.
willing to deal with his two natures. It is an amazing portion of scripture, ten verses of scripture, which speaks to the very heart of who we are as human beings. That each and every one of us struggle with the two natures. Mm -hmm. And Paul does not run away from us from it, but exposes his weaknesses and his struggles, the battle of the two nations. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this time of worship and fellowship. Father, as we pause now to break your word, knowing that your word is a living word, allow us, your children of God, to feast and supper from it. And Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. And so, my brothers and sisters, now, I don't know about you, but when I read Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 25, to 25 I find myself asking many questions. Because in these 10 verses, we find the Apostle Paul, as I said, conflicted and seemingly confused, asking himself many questions, asking himself why is he, on a daily basis, confronted and fighting between his flesh and his soul? Why is this constant battle between the two natures, the nature of the law and the nature of God's grace? Why is there this constant battle between the nature of good and the nature of evil? I believe that we ask ourselves that same question. Often, why do I still do the things I do but I know they are wrong? Why am I still in this abusive relationship when I know that it is hurting me hurting my children and hurting my family? Why do I still take drugs when I know it's going to eventually kill me, destroy the relationship between me and my parents and my siblings, and bring my reputation to ill repeat? Why do I still disobey God? Many times in Paul and St. Andrews, when we ask these questions, we know the answer. Because many times we can still hear that still small voice in our ears telling us that what we are about to do is wrong. And yet, we still do it. We can feel the Spirit prompting us in our hearts and in our spirits telling us, reminding us that what we are about to do is wrong. And still we become unresponsive to the promptings of God's Spirit. These verses of Scripture, my brothers and sisters, impresses me that Paul, who was called by God to be an apostle, met him on the road to Damascus. The Lord changed his name from Saul to Paul, that he is no longer over there, but over here with the Lord, the one who persecuted the church, and now has been called to further the church, struggles with these inner conflicts, struggles with dealing with what is wrong and what is right, and we see that before Paul is totally immense in God's spirit. Paul still does wrong and he is conflicted. Now in his epistle he doesn't tell us what the wrong he has done and I really don't care because wrong is wrong. And yet Paul tells us that he struggled and yet he gives us the opening, the door as to how to overcome. I believe that sometimes when we make mistakes, we say to ourselves, I could kick myself, or I had it coming, or even better yet, I should have known better. That tells you that God is working with you. 
when there is no conscience, when people can do wrong and never check themselves, they are not of God. But many times, all of us make mistakes. We are always conflicted. I should not have said that. I should not have done it that way. I should have held my temper. That is when the Spirit is working with you. And that is what Paul is talking about here with us this morning. Paul wanted to do what was right, yet somehow he could not get it right. He knew it was wrong. And the last thing he wanted to do was to do wrong. Yet somehow he did it. And the good he knew he should do, he couldn't bring himself to do it. Sometimes, my friends, we feel ourselves pulled into two directions. As if two powerful forces is pulling us apart. One force is pulling us towards God, and the other force is pulling us towards sin and darkness. When a good man does something that is wrong, even though he knows that it is wrong, because the temptation is so great, we know that he is submitting himself to the vials of the enemy. And let us not fool ourselves, Christians. In the life of the Christians, there is that struggle with sin. If we want to be honest, we will admit that. It is a constant reminder of our past sinful nature. It is a constant occurrence reminding us of our two natures. So you see, Paul was frustrated with his inability to see what was good and the, in, and the inability to do it. He was frustrated with his inability to see what was wrong and his inability to refrain from doing it. All of us who walk this Christian life can say in all honesty that we came from a past life, that we struggled we didn't just born and wake up one morning and, 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 and go out here. We had to struggle. We had to walk that walk until we got to this place. Philosophers and theologians have struggled with this dilemma throughout the ages. How could Paul, a righteous man, an apostle of Christ, engage in such behavior? And yet, the answer is simple. We all struggle with it. We all have our bad days. And we all are tempted. Boy, you could go to church Sunday morning. Hmm? You could go to missionary service. Evangelical service. And Monday morning you go to work and the devil comes. Oh, Lord. You can see them walking. Wait, you know. You can see the look on their faces. And you know you're in trouble. You know you're going to get into an argument. You know you're going to use some words that you, you used to use in the past, and they just rise and surface. <laughs> and then I know that never happened to you. <laughs> oh, no. They take you back to the old life, Brother Leroy. As hard as you've been waking and trying, on your knees, praying every morning. Amen. Was the, huh? the great philosopher. Seneca talked about how men hate their sins and love them at the same time. The great Roman poet Ovid said, I see the better things and I approve them, but I follow the worst. No one knew this better than the Jews. For 400 years they prayed to God that they were in the land of persecution. The Egyptians made them make bricks without straw, beat them, put their feet on their necks, and they struggled to breathe, and they prayed to God, and God sent them Moses. And Moses took them across the Red Sea that God parted, and allowed the enemies to be destroyed. And as soon as they got over, they built a golden cup in the face of God. God took 
them through the wilderness and the desert, fed them when they were hungry, gave them water when they were thirsty, sent manna down from heaven, and still they complain about it. It's like all you have in your kitchen is corn, meat, and rice. You walk it to your friend and he asks you, where's the steak? <laughs> I don't eat nothing but steak. Then go and buy it yourself. <laughs> the question for us this morning is, are we any different? Are we any better? There are Christians who claim that they love the Lord, but they still practice racism. There are Christians who have much, but they still want to take what little the poor has. There are Christians who are privileged, but they still want to deny you the same privilege. There are those who are given every possible right, but they want to deny you your simple, basic civil rights. There are those who are rich beyond measure, but they still want to come and take what your great-grandparents, your parents, and your grandparents struggle and die for to leave you. What God has bequeathed to you and they still want to come. They got all the riches in the world. They still want to come and take the little you got. As we contemplate these passages of scripture, we must put them in their context in which Paul puts it. The law and grace. The Jews would say that God gave them the law to keep them from falling prey to sin. The Jews believed theoretically that it should work to limit the activities of a person in order to limit his evil choices. They would say, take no more than a hundred steps on the Sabbath. That means stay and you know what at home. <laughs> don't go outside and don't get involved in nothing and everything will be all right. You know that ain't no truth. Bring it in today's context. And it's like, go to church every Sunday, pay your tithes, and everything is going to be well with you. That ain't no truth. Not so. Not so. The Jews would say, all you need to do is learn the law of God and will keep you safe in times of temptation. And I agree. Point. The point is that the scripture lessons and the nursery rhymes we learn in school help us to understand who God is and what God is. And many times when we are, tem when we are tempted, we go back to those scripture lessons we learn when we were children. I remember when we were headed, my wife would remember this, we were driving from Dunn to Charlotte. Was it Charlotte Lynch for the surgery for Kenya? Raleigh. Yes, it was Raleigh. We were driving. And everyone, me, Lynn, Dwarka, and Rita, we were scared to death. Because Kenya had to take two surgeries at once. They had to put her on a special bed and do open heart surgery. And at the same time, once they would have done the surgery, they had to switch her over and work on her spine. And I prayed from Dunn to Raleigh. I was scared as a bat. But yet Kenya was in the back seat singing nursery rhymes. Do you remember that? Day? Now I let it be a born of a little teddy bear. She was a little small child holding on to that teddy bear. And she was saying to God, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray my soul, my Lord, to keep. If I should die, when she said, if I should die, I started crying. <laughs> I said, Lord, please don't die. If I should die before I live, I pray my soul, my Lord, my Lord. And when they prepped her for the operation, I ran up on the fourth floor. I just couldn't, I didn't want, I didn't want to be there. And they, she would not go into the operating room without me being there. 
And so they were aging and out, ducking and dodging. I didn't want to go. Finally, the doctor came to me and said, they're not going to do the surgery in this year. So I had to go downstairs. I said, Daddy, pray with me. Here, a minister of God's word, afraid, and a little child is not afraid. And after we held hands and we prayed, Kenya walked into the operating room and she never looked back. God is good. Yes. Yes. Paul says that every attempt to follow the letter of the law is bound to fail if you do not have a relationship with the risen Christ. What you do and what you say even if it is good, if it is not from the heart, it will fail. I want to repeat that. Even though you may do good, if it is not from the heart, it will fail. If I give my sister this, and I say, huh, take it. You don't mean it's you, right? You think God is going to bless you? No. I could go and bribe as much as I want. The missionaries went to Africa and they fed and they clothed the people. But they made them slaves. They made them house boys. And they made them maids. And they took their land. They did it because when they saw the gold, and when they saw the diamonds, and when they saw the richness of the land, and that the Africans didn't care too much about it, and the Africans welcomed them, they took their land and they took their inheritance. And what the missionaries did caused a law of hatred and ill will in this world today. You ask yourself the question, well, the, the, the Jews were enslaved and the Chinese and the Filipinos and the Mexicans, they were abused as well. The difference is they did not take away their names, they did not take away their culture, they did not take away their religion, and they did not steal their inheritance. And so the, those communities remain a community and a society. And that is passed down to us that we struggle to work together, we as my people. We struggle to trust one another. We struggle to believe one another. And that is the sin of us here in the Bahamas. Today I stand to tell you and to reveal to you some of the sins we have committed as a people. We have allowed people to come and take what God has bequeathed unto us. There are no Bahamians who own any hotels or resorts, and yet we invented tourism. I want you to think about that for a moment. Even the Jamaicans could come and set up several hotels in our country, but not one Bahamian is allowed to own a hotel. They want to come and dig up our land, and take it and make billions of dollars and have one old breakdown um, excavator and McSeymour to dig up the dirt and transport it to the United States. And after 47 years, we still allow it. And behemoths are not angry enough to say enough is enough. Preach about, preach about, preach about. We don't even own our telephone system. Paper, they took that too. We gotta pay 28 cents per kilowatt hour when it should be 8 cents in, in, in Guyana. Poor country, they pay 8 cents. And we behemoths pay 28 cents. And you know what they say to us? They say it's not enough. We need to charge your behemoths 28 cents because we got investors in Canada and we need to satisfy them. Oh Lord, my God. How long do my people close their eyes? They come and they say they want 500,000 acres of land in Andos. 
the land of the birth of my parents. That's a third of all of Andrus. And they want the right to dig up the land and take it back to the United States. Ask yourself the question, how come the Americans won't allow them to dig up their land? But they want to come to our country because we are some little black boys and girls. And all we do is win, but they don't bring jobs. We can create our own jobs. We can create our own children. Some say that they are stronger than us. I say no. That's a lie. Some say they have more money than us. And I say, okay, so what? You got the land. We don't even own an airport. The airport is not open. So we don't want it. They spent ten million dollars to build that airport, and they made us pay for it. From 1992, we've been paying $10. Every ticket you purchase, you don't even realize it. Every ticket you purchase, $10 is attached to your ticket to pay for that airport. And I ask myself, how long are we going to pay $10 million? When is it going to stop? We don't even own our port. We don't own it. And you say, after 47 years, you want to celebrate? But I'm angry. I'm angry. And I'm waiting for someone to come to my house so I can tell them a piece of my mind. They say we don't have the skill sets. Well, that's another lie. That's the biggest lie from the pit of hell. I drove yesterday to Eight Mile Rock and I saw the government building that is being built. It is so beautiful. It is first class. Behaviors can do first class work. And I'll tell you another lie. Listen to me carefully. If you take all the countries in the world, per capita, Bahamians are the most educated. We came from a fishing village. And what our parents said. We, I'm going to educate my children. Right. And that's the reason why Bahamian mothers and fathers struggle to send their children to college. Yes. And because of successive governments not embracing our children, they stay abroad. Yes, and that's the problem. Yes. There's nothing to come home to. They come home to. They go work for somebody. I think I'm serving I told a minister just the other day, we had a discussion. And I told him that I am very depressed. And he said, why? Why are you depressed? I said, my heart is so low what my spirit is low. Because God gave us this beautiful country, the richest country other than the United States and the Western yes, Hemisphere. That's right. And all we do is squander yeah. for a couple jobs. The fellow who comes for the 500,000 acres can take that to the bank and he could get billions of dollars. Yes, the port in Nassau, they made us pay for it. They floated the same port we owned, they sold back to us. Are you listening to me? The port we own in Nassau, they sold it back to us. Floated a bond, an IPO, and had Bahamians buy into it, raise $250 million. The government should have come to us and said, listen, baby, we need $250 million. We can hire them to do the work on our port, and we own the port. They wait for us. Nassau International Airport, they got a Canadian company running it for us. Bahamians can't run an airport. We've been running an airport from time immemorial until they came and made money. But Temple, $50 million the government took all of the every single year. And we sold it for $150 million. We are like Jacob. Huh? Selling our inheritance for a bowl of porridge. That's why I'm not celebrating. Huh? That's why I'm angry. And I'm hoping that I'm getting you angry. Get angry. And tell them straighten up or fly right. I 
And these voices of scripture, the apostle Paul invites us to do what he did. And we gotta do that. The apostle Paul confronted his sins. And we got many of the behaviors. We have five families, brothers and sisters. Five families that own 90% of the wealth in this country. In 1967, when the government changed, nothing really changed. They found a way to control more and more of it. And then their sons and daughters want to bring foreigners to own more. Stand up. Stop them. Do they allow it to happen? When I think about my children, when I think about my two daughters and my one son, I am depressed because I don't know what I'm going to leave them. Because the farmers want to take it all. And you all want to give it. Huh? They own the beaches. Most of our beaches. For me to go on the beach and enjoy myself, I got to go and go to Andres and ask you to allow me to, to go on the beach. <laughs> And the Chinese coming to the take your rest. The Chinese beat the uh, the Africans in China. In China, if you are not Chinese, you can't move land. You can't open no business. But they can come here. And they can open business. And they can open land. And they can receive citizenship. And the game is said, though, then go into the Chinese uh, restaurant in and you buy one of the things. Chicken fried rice. You all don't put this on the internet. <laughs> We need to confront it. And we need to ask God to strengthen us as a people to be thankful for how he has blessed us. The most beautiful people in the Caribbean lives right here in the huh? You all see some pretty people? You go down to our Bay Street and watch those pretty, no, I mean, those, uh, uh, my wife is here, but I, I only say, uh, I only say, you know what I'm saying? Woman, huh? She knows how to dress, she knows how to speak, and she's poised, she's educated. Huh? Think about that, how blessed you are. Think about how your grandparents and your parents fought for what you are. Ain't nobody could put no knee on your neck. That's right. Huh? You can walk any place in this country and you're free. That's what they fought for. You can live anywhere. Nobody can stop you from living anywhere. They may try. They may can't. They can't stop you. So take what is yours. Cherish what is yours. Defend what is yours. And protect what is yours. The Lord bless you. Father, thank you for your word. Let your word go forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.